Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's 1 million by 1 million strategy roundtable for entrepreneurs. 1 by 1 M, as you know, is the first global virtual accelerator for technology startups in the world. Our mission is to help a million entrepreneurs reach a million dollars and beyond in annual revenue. In support of the mission, we do these free mentoring roundtables every week. This is the 583rd session. So this has been going on since 2008. And uh, it started as a little experiment and then blossomed into something quite extensive. And now we have done 583 sessions and uh, every single recording is available on our YouTube channel if you're interested in uh, looking at some of the older sessions. Uh, that's the YouTube channel, one and one and round tables. Uh, on Twitter, you can Find me at Stromana and 1M by 1M at 1M by 1M. And uh, these are the instructions for calling in. So you can, this is a round table, not a broadcast. So we want you to participate as much as you would like. Uh, the public chat, Q&A, all those are open. I will open up the uh, line for you to call in as well a little bit later. We have scheduled programming first. We are going to start today's session with a conversation with Powell Madge from Warsaw Equity Group. Powell, welcome to the show. Hello, uh, Samana. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for the invitation and welcome as well. So, Powell, tell us about uh, what's up in uh, Poland. You are in, in semi-war zone. So, how, how are things going and, and what's the atmosphere like and, and what's happening with the startup ecosystem? Well, uh, on one hand, uh, uh, luckily, uh, we don't see any war zone by ourselves. The war is uh, in Ukraine, which is our uh, neighbor country. Although we see the effects, uh, we had just a huge wave of immigrants or, uh, yeah. coming from the Ukraine to Poland, especially women and children that were fleeing for their safety. Uh, we already admitted almost 5 million immigrants. Uh, just in the in the period of just few few weeks so it was crazy actually and the involvement of the polish population bringing everyone to the uh, under the roofs uh, welcoming and helping them out it was just incredible so in just difficult times it was very great to see the polish population polish community to coming together and helping our neighbors so yeah. Yeah. that's really heartwarming to see how well the polish people have welcomed the ukrainians well, but you know, probably it, it, our uh, 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 they were uh, Ukrainians are our brothers, uh, uh, they are our neighbors, but also we share the same history and we have the same uh, worry regarding the safety. Also, look at the, our uh, shared history with the with the Russia, also as our neighbor. Yeah. So you know that there's a big uh, actually very uh, 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 there's a lot uh, of empathy uh, in the population for their situation. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So uh, let's talk about the startup situation and uh, talk about Warsaw Equity Group, your fund. What what are the particulars of the fund? We're going to get into those details. Okay, so I guess I should start with a, a short pitch, a short introduction of, of the fund first. So uh, my name is Pablo Mai. I'm investment director of Warsaw Equity Group. Uh, uh, my fund. We are a family office with headquarters in Warsaw, as the name implies. However, we invest in the whole region, Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, we are a family office. We have $150 million under management. And our focus are B2B uh, startups, hardware and software, especially in uh, um, automation and process improvements um, that, uh, uh, that are headquartered, that are located in, in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, mm -hmm. Our investment ticket, uh, since we are a family office, but we are a multi-stage fund, we invest in private equity uh, uh, like deals we invest in uh, venture capital type deals and also we are lp we invest in uh, pre-seed and seed funds uh, as the investor but you invest directly uh, into companies 
So we invest directly into the companies, but also we invest indirectly, uh, becoming investor in uh, at early no, stage. No, I got it. I got it that you're a fund of funds that. and you invest in funds. But uh, yes. you know, yeah. the, for the interest of this conversation, it, we are mainly interested in your direct investment activities. Okay. Into, so we invest uh, directly. Also, startup. our main direct activities regard uh, uh, venture capital. We do late seed and Series A investments direct into the startups. So let's uh, talk about what kind of uh, ticket size do you write when you do a seed investment or a series A investment? What is your preferred ticket size? Our initial uh, investment is between one to five million dollars. And uh, 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 we are able to invest additional up to five million in the follow on rounds. So in total, including the first investments and the follow ones, we are able to invest up to 10 million per per project per startup. Okay, so B two B one to five million, and with follow on another five potentially. Now, exactly. what um, uh, what do you want to see in a company that would give you comfort to write a one million dollar or upward of one million dollar check? What proof points do you need to see? Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, we uh, we are a later stage investor, so first of all, we expect that the companies are ready at uh, post product and post revenue stage. So we expect to see already uh, um, a product, uh, even if it's a, a service or if it's a physical product or a or a SaaS solution. We expect to be it commercial ready. We expect to have the first revenues. Uh, we focus on uh, startups that have at least fifty thousand dollars MRR. Or in case of hardware, at least fifty thousand uh, dollars per margin uh, monthly. Uh, we expect to have already uh, that there is already like a complete uh, core team, and we also expect uh, the project. We like to see the project uh, to to be working, uh, even if it's a niche, but the, the niche that we're able to grow the project at least uh, 10, 20 times fold uh, since our investment. Oh. And. Um... So there is a there's an interesting subtlety in post revenue investment that I want to probe with you. Um, so, in a sense, the the stage that you're talking about is uh, probably a little a term post seed pre series A all the way to series A, right? Yep. So now you want to see revenue, great. Um, there are a few things that are in the pre-series A, post-seed, pre-series A stage that happens that I want to get your input on. So, you know, the, the notion of repeatability, the notion of velocity. Companies do really well if they find the go-to-market strategy, the unit economics and everything that gives them velocity, that gives them a lot of repeatability. If it's an enterprise customer, if they're selling to enterprises, they want to figure out how to repeatably sell to lots of customers quickly, you know, with reasonable sales cycles. Um, am I reading you right in saying that these are things that you're okay with not being fully fleshed out and can be fleshed out after your investment comes in? Um, to some extent, yes. I mean, we would like to see the first uh, traction regarding repeatable sales. So, we are looking already at the product market fit. We are already yeah. looking for, a, we like to see the companies that they already figured out a repeatable way to sell the product. It doesn't have to be to enterprises, it can be to SMBs. But uh, we are, later, as later stage investor, we are more keen to provide capital to scale what's already working than provide capital for, uh, uh, for, for seeking the to see what sticks. So, uh, uh, so, uh, and in our case, it comes from the from our approach that uh, we would like to have about 10, 15 companies in our portfolio at any given moment, provide them even a larger amount of capital, but also being able to focus, to work with them, being much more hands-on since our history heritage comes from private equity market. This is from where we come from. And now we are investing at uh, early and early stages. So uh, 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 the strategy that works at uh, seed investments, pre-seed or seed, 
usually in the smaller tickets, but with much larger amount of projects to spread the risk among your portfolio. In our case, we are, uh, don't have a large enough team to have a, a large operational focus to be able to provide hands on experience for 50 companies, let's say, in our portfolio. This is why we would prefer to invest at later stage after product market fit to be able to work very closely hands on with the portfolio companies. So, so, so yeah. this is why we so, this. But the reason I'm kind of proving this point, and for those of you who are listening mm -hmm. to this conversation, please note uh, there are a bunch of things that happen between you know, pre seed, seed, pre series A, series A in this continuum. You have to achieve product market fit, which means you have to get some customers to say that, yes, I want this product and, and that I'm willing to write checks. Then you have to figure out a repeatable way of doing that over and over and over again, right? So it's, it's not one company, one customer buying your product. You have to get numerous customers buying your product. So 50,000 ARR, depending on what is your average sales average sale price or average, uh, you know, um, deal size, it's a, still a small number of customers, most likely, unless you're selling a $5 per mm -hmm. customer kind of product. Yeah. Um, yes. But then if you want but to go also from... Also, very important... Uh, let me finish just one second, uh, Paul. Uh, let me uh, set uh, the framework yes, and yes, I'll, yes, I'll yes. come back to you. Um, so then, you know, go from five customers to 50 customers to 500 customers to 5,000 customers. This is the continuum that you're trying to travel in building a significant company. And, and that is where you are in that continuum. In the 50,000 ARR maybe, uh, sorry, MRR, maybe you are in, in the five to 50 customer range, but you, you may not have fully figured out the full spectrum of how you're going to go from 50 customers to 500 customers or 500 customers to 5,000 customers. These are the nuances of questions that you should be asking the investors that you that are looking at your company to evaluate your company on where is their comfort zone. This is the notion of investor entrepreneur fit that you've heard me talk about ad nauseum. You know, investors will invest in their comfort zone, not in your comfort zone. Investors have their own comfort zones, just like Paul is explaining that there is a certain sweet spot in which Warsaw Equity Group likes to invest. There's a certain geographical sweet spot, there's a certain stage sweet spot, there's a certain industry sector sweet spot. It's B2B SaaS in, Western, uh, in Eastern Europe and Central Europe and in this kind of post-seed pre-series A sweet spot. This is what I'm hearing from Powell. So, yes. so coming back, Paul, um, can we do some examples, some case studies of companies that you have invested in and tell us not only about what those companies are, what they do, also when did they come to you, what did they show you that caught your attention, that captured your imagination enough mm -hmm. to want to write these checks? Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> Uh, before I start, uh, I will have to say that our portfolio right now is very uh, d diversified since uh, so it comes from the from, from our history. Uh, as I told you, we started as a private equity fund. Uh, we're doing uh, more like a buyout deals, greenfield investments, uh, also working with very traditional sectors. Since the last two years, we are uh, rebuilding our portfolio, changing our strategy to invest more into tech startups, more like investor capital deals uh, at uh, uh, the early stages, smaller tickets, early stages. Uh, actually, myself, I joined the fund uh, this year to, uh, to, to execute the strategy. So th th there was a lot of changes, but we found we found a model that we like to execute and continue for the years to come. Um, and in our strategy, uh, we have uh, uh, the, 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 we like to invest at least fifty million dollars in the next two to three years, mostly focusing on, you, you uh, on venture have a capital. And... Yet. You don't have a portfolio yet on this investment pieces that we just discussed. Oh, well, we do, but we just started executing the, executing the strategy. So, for example. Uh, this year, we already uh, went through two, two investments. We contacted two investments. 
So let's uh, talk right about now we are closing two additional. That, that's what I want to talk about okay. is okay. is the uh, is the com okay. companies that you have invested in that you have gone through this cycle of evaluating and investing in. So tell me about mm -hmm. what those companies are and what did you see when they came to you? How did they come to you? What did you see when they came to you? Okay, perfect. So probably a great example of our strategy and our approach. It's a investment that we conducted in March of this year. It's a Polish company, uh, which name is Netfaza. They provide merchants that sell on Amazon, a software to automate their tasks, how to onboard to, uh, to, to Amazon platform and how to, and how to, uh, uh, how to do all the selling processes on Amazon, how to automate them. Amazon um, sellers. Uh, the, the target yeah. market is Amazon sellers. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Uh, who, who already on Amazon platform would like to automate the task, or maybe new merchants are just coming to, to Amazon platform and are, are seeking for a task solution that will help them out with these processes, especially where they have high volume on, on the Amazon platform. Mm -hmm. So uh, we decided to invest uh, in, in, in the company when uh, already uh, they had traction, so they were post product, post revenue hitting uh, over this $50,000 MRR target. Yeah. So uh, for, for us, it's very important criteria for the selection. As you, as you told uh, our viewers, uh, each investor has its sweet spot. In our case, uh, uh, the, 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 the segment, the industry, the business model and the traction are key elements to decide which step meets our investment criteria. Yeah. If we have startup that meets most of the criteria, but for example, has smaller traction, we, we like to keep in touch, we build a relationship, but we, we, we perform the investment we'll decision the until investment. the, the KPI yeah. is this the traction is actually, regarding the, the MRR. This is an important uh, point to note for people who are listening is that uh, sometimes when you're in the fundraising cycle, you may not be quite ready for the investor to write the check, but you build the relationship, you're showing traction, then you keep in touch It's like, okay, this month we have crossed this MRR and then this next, this month we've crossed the next MRR milestone. And, and, and at some point it will converge potentially if you know what your target is, right? In this case, Powell is explaining that the target is $50,000 MRR. So, if you start the relationship when you're at the $10,000 MRR point, you kind of have to inch your way up to $50,000 MRR and, and, and then perhaps the investment is going to happen. But that, that investor relationship management is important if you have otherwise a good fit. If the market is of interest and the yeah. team is of interest, mm -hmm. then sometimes investors just take a little bit of time to see how you're performing to get to their comfort zone. That is the notion of investor entrepreneur fit. Exactly. So, and uh, something that I'd like to add up and maybe uh, to, to suggest your, your listeners, uh, uh, often uh, there is, uh, 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 even though there is a fit, that there is no enough traction, that's a sweet spot for the investor. As you said, it's a matter of uh, entrepreneur investor relationship. Something that I don't see very often, I like, and I would like to see much more often, is the founders, the startups that are during the fundraising mode, uh, prepare and uh, execute like a, a, a investor newsletter. So they prepare like a newsletter, and they uh, keep sending the updates, let's say quarterly or uh, every month, every quarter, every half a year. If given yeah. potential investor agrees upon receiving such a correspondence. And then it's a great way, you know, to keep in touch, to remember temperature yourself. And once you keep the, the metrics, the KPIs that are in the sweet spot of the investor, you know, the investor will come back by themselves and say, okay, thank you for this update, for this news, newsletter. For, for us, it's the right moment to come back to the discussion regarding the investment. And then you change the dynamic, yes. And then the investor, you know, doesn't forget about you. And then he's the, he or she has the opportunity to come back to the table when the, the, this is the right, yeah. uh, right moment. Definitely, definitely, definitely. And, and I think that in that process of covering that ground from, you know, if you are below the threshold where the investor and entrepreneur comfort zone, fits comfort zone is, uh, try to also develop the strategy and, and develop that repeatability notion. The whole game in B2B SaaS, 
The whole game is the repeatability of customer acquisition at a reasonable unit economics. So there are a number of factors that you have to take into account to pass due diligence, and, and those are repeatability, those are unit economics, those are you know, reasonable customer acquisition costs and so forth. So, so uh, let's actually talk, Paul, also about what's happening in the region in Eastern and Central Europe where you are working. What kind of deal flow are you seeing in B2B SaaS? Is B2B SaaS really active? What's happening? What, what, I mean, how many companies in your, the zone that you're interested in, how many B2B SaaS companies are there? Well, it's a great question. We don't have like any centralized database, but I, I would say that, that we have uh, probably between five to 10,000 startups uh, in B2B uh, SaaS in Central and Eastern Europe. It's just my like a uh, private guess, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, since there is no uh, official data. Uh, B2B SaaS dominates the, the, the venture capital deal flow. Uh, uh, this is where most of the investments happen actually. Um, and this is the business that's the easiest to scale internationally also outside the region yeah. uh, because uh, the investor, even the local investors or the regional investors, on the one hand, they have smaller tickets. So it's much, much more difficult to scale hardware business. It's much more difficult to scale uh, platforms or marketplaces. So uh, B2B SaaS, especially for the early stage investors, are the most prefer uh, the, the most preferred uh, investment types that they like to consider and like to invest. And how are you viewing uh, exit strategy in your investment thesis for the fund vis-a-vis -vis these B2B SaaS companies? What are you thinking? Are you thinking that you're going to build unicorn from the region, or are you thinking of looking for you know earlier exits? What what kind of you know investment thesis are you working on the basis mm -hmm. of? Um, in case of Warsaw Equity Group, actually, we are not in the game of chasing uh, unicorns. Uh, we uh, we uh, we look at uh, at uh, reasonable returns. So actually, we are looking at uh, startups that we believe uh, can increase the value of our investment uh, tenfold or more. But it doesn't have to be unicorn. So we believe that. Uh, as we as we look at the market and the competitors, our colleagues from venture capital private equity, we see that too often chasing unicorns means uh, too, ex, uh, 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 too too much capital uh, uh, chasing the increased revenues at uh, metrics that do not make sense actually. You know, too, too high board, etc. So actually, we are more keen to look at uh, very high businesses which have B two B, let's say, SaaS businesses that have great metrics. And for us, you know, they do not have to have the ambition to become unicorns. For us, it's good enough, you know, if they have the ambition to grow, let's say, maintain their 100% growth year over year for the next five or, or 10 years. And if it means that they will not become unicorns, but they will, let's say, tenfold their evaluation and tenfold their business size, for us, it's good enough, actually. This is the kind of businesses and the founders that we are looking for. Mm -hmm. You know, we are very big fans of capital efficient businesses that are not necessarily chasing unicorns. And, and, and partly the, the problem I have with this unicorn chasing, mindless unicorn chasing is flushing these companies with too much capital. And then the exit bar is so high that, uh, you know, companies basically end up in this twilight zone where they are burning too much cash and, and can't raise more money and, and can't find an exit because the valuation requirements are too high to have a profitable exit, etc. So I'm actually pleased to hear that you are thinking, you know, that you're acknowledging that there are other ways of building businesses. Now, there is a question, though, um, how, much, how much exit capacity exists? in the region for, you know, if there are five, 10,000 startups and, and most of them are going to seek exits, how do you think this is going to play out? Uh-oh, did we lose the audio? So folks, the reason I will let Powell figure out how to, ah, you're back. Well, it's a great, a great question. Uh, well, it's a great question. In our case, uh, uh, we see at least three pathways for the exit. On one hand, uh, 
our focus when we invest in startups, we seek the startups that actually already are doing business at least in the region or maybe are selling the products to uh, to more international base of the clients of customers. So the focus is not solely on local market, let's say Poland, Bulgaria, Romania, not even Central Eastern Europe. We are seeking start from this region, but the idea of startup from our perspective is a startup that already has very broad uh, customer base and already they proven that they can sell also outside the region, let's say Western Europe, the, the North America, maybe the Australia, etc. So uh, the, the, the more sales they bring from outside the region the, uh, of the Central Eastern Europe, the higher priority of the exit also among the strategic investors that are outside the Central Eastern Europe. So uh, this increases the probability of the exit to a much larger international global corporate. Uh, uh, so it's uh, also very important uh, uh, when you mention the sales and the metrics for the B B2B B SaaS, it's also very important uh, when, when they, where do you generate your sales, geographically speaking? Do you generate your sales only in one country or region? Yeah. Uh, if it's the states, okay, it's good enough. But if you generate the sales on a very small local market, there's also the, always the question of the investor, uh, what happens when you reach the full capacity of this local market? Will be able to go outside this local market to further expand your startup? In our case, the idea or the scenario is the startup that already maybe doesn't have a, a, a huge MRR, maybe it, it, it is only $50,000, let's say MRR, but already among a broad scope of uh, customers from uh, uh, different uh, geographical regions. And then the right. probability of the exit among corporations from outside the, the region are, are much more higher. So, what, you know, we have worked a lot with uh, this model um, with the Indian startups, you know, in the, the Indian market is full of B2B SaaS startups now. And uh, one of the things that the Indian investors have learned is that it's fine, it's, it's actually great to validate the market of business, validate, validate the customers in the Indian market or in the Asian market, and then very quickly they come to North America and then chase the global market. Mm -hmm. This is, you know, it's a tried and true formula. They're using it constantly and building very good companies based on this formula. There is, um, nonetheless, I think you can imagine just in Central Europe and Eastern Europe, you have five to 10,000 B2B SaaS startups. India probably alone has, you know, that many and many more. Um, so the, the volume of B2B startups right now, SaaS startups is very, very large. So the number of companies that are gonna be trying to do this is, is very, very large. Um, so one one thing I would like to point out is that I think as this market matures, there are going to be private equity led roll ups and some of the exit is going to be not into the strategics but into these private equity roll ups and if you if you you, you talked about Amazon sellers, uh, that's a market where this is already happening. There are private equity roll ups happening of Amazon brands that are getting some traction and then some private equity company comes in or they create an umbrella brand and under which they roll up a whole bunch of you know good brands that are scaling nicely so i suspect that this is going to i don't suspect i predict <laughs> this is going to happen in the b2b SaaS world as well you agree mm -hmm. yes of course uh, we are the uh... Well, we don't see it much in Central and Eastern Europe yet. We see it in the okay. in the more developed countries, <laughs> Western Europe, yet. the States. Yeah, we also see that more and more, uh, uh, more and more often, uh, 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 larger startups uh, they buy buy out the smaller startups as well. You know, to to to, uh, yeah, to, to speed up the, the scale of the business. Strategic exits, yes. The largest, largest, yes. Yeah, actually, larger startups buying out. You know, not just public companies buying out smaller startups, but larger startups buying out smaller startups is happening. Exactly. Especially exactly. the ones that are doing this unicorn route and they're flush with capital and are not showing enough revenues are a great exit target for the smaller startups exactly. that are capital efficient exactly. and are showing good, uh, good momentum. Yes, absolutely. So, very good. All right. Well, um, Paul, I hear that you're going to stay on for the pitches, yes? Yes. Okay. Yes, of course. Terrific. 
So folks, um, before we begin, quick expectation setting. Don't be nervous, don't be defensive. We are on your side. This is a safe working session. You don't have to worry about, you know, having a thin skin on this. We can discuss what your issues are and we can strategize and brainstorm about how to deal with those issues and accelerate your journey. If you disagree with the feedback you get here, that's fine. It is your venture. You do whatever you want with it. But generally, the feedback comes, you know, it's considered feedback. So feedback tends to be very good and very sharp. So please do not um, be defensive in receiving that feedback. You will get the most out of this session if you are open to that constructive feedback. We have no agenda other than helping you become successful. So, so take that feedback in that spirit. Okay. Methos, is that how you say it? Your name? Tell me, teach me how to pronounce your name. <laughs> it's Mteto. The S is just a mistake. I don't know how it happened. It's Mteto. 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 Yes. Okay. Mteto. Yes. Tell us. Uh, yes. <laughs> tell us what you're working on. You're in South Africa. You're in Pretoria. Okay. Fantastic. Yes. Yes, I'm in Pretoria in South Africa, and I am so privileged and blessed to, to be among this conversation that's happening today. And thanks very much for, for, for your prompt response on the day uh, to receive me so well and guide me to this point. Thank you very much, uh, 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 Salamina. Uh, I hope I call welcome. you. I, call, I hope I call your name. Yeah. I can teach you how to pronounce my name. My name is pronounced <laughs> Romana. <laughs> <laughs> you taught me okay. how to pronounce Mteto. I'm teaching you how to pronounce my name, which is Shromana. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Shamana. Yes. So uh, what are you so, doing? Tell us what you're working on. Yeah, I I'm kind of a business that has got three legs uh onto it. But I just put this one here because I believe this one may be with the possibility of attraction. And also when I listen today that there is much uh, greater potential for this one than the three others but i'll share them anyway uh the, we supply balls and nuts so the idea here i was working for Arcelor Metal, the company of lakshmi metal in south africa for eight years but mm -hmm. i was working uh in the hr i was the head of their hr department so when i left when i exited that role I had developed a passion for, for steel products mm -hmm. because I see that this is an international product, an international commodity that is used across the world. And um, in South Africa, it's only uh, Im imported. Uh, the final product is imported into South Africa and the raw mm -hmm. materials are exported. So, so that alone uh, gives me an opportunity. If I can find a product made of steel, that I can, you know, uh, uh, sell it internationally and locally, then then I would have found the formula. So um, this is a starting up, starting point with uh, balls and nuts that we supply. And uh, the way we supply this one is we are supplying it via, there is a company that I am buying, it's called Fine Blanking. So Fine Blanking is a company that is owned by two directors who are trying to exit the business. And I'm trying to acquire that business. And when I acquire the business, then I'm going to turn it because it's already got the nice um, manufacturing facility. Uh, all it needs is modern modernization and obviously automation inside of it. And they do have international customers inside of fine blanking. We have had an agreement with them, uh, the, 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 the buyout agreement with them. However, in the past two years, the funds have been really, really, really bad. And uh, it's been difficult to find um, equity partners that could come and assist us in that, in that whole plan. However, uh, the Madomela group itself already in terms of uh, how, do we, how do we trade? We trade as a retailer, we trade, we send our customers to, 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 to the supplier that we want to buy. We are registered with uh, most mines in South Africa. I was trying to finalize the registration with Sibanya Steelwater yesterday. We are an approved vendor at Harmony Gold Mine. 
and uh, we do that uh, 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 by obviously in interacting with all the mines locally as well. And these are mine. These mining houses are international, like your Anglo-American, your 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 Stillwater, Sibanye, um, uh, 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 as well as your your. Um, um, uh, what what uh, I just and forgot. Please, the I name. have a question for you. Um, yes. Why did you choose this product in the international market? Is there a gap in the nuts and bolts business? If you, you're, you're saying that you want to sell in South Africa and in the international market, nuts and bolts, steel products, nuts and bolts, is that something that needs to be reinvented? Is that abundantly available in the market and, and it doesn't? Need another supplier? Why does it need another supplier? What is the case for? Yeah, yeah. The, the the case for the African market, for the African continent at large, they are not making bolts and nuts. They bring them across from China, and uh, the manufacturing of steel happens in the West Africa as well as in South Africa. And in the West Africa, there's a, the same company is making steel which is uh, Aslometal and others, uh, smaller markets that are in, in, in the game. So the entire African market has been serviced up to Nigeria, up to Egypt, by, mm -hmm. but they, they're selling uh, unprocessed steel. So okay. for pro- so, so for pro Let me synthesize. I think I understood, I got, got my, my answer. You're saying that China is supplying the the, the nuts and bolts to the entire African market. There is steel being produced in Africa by ArcelorMittal, and and you think you can take instead of buying the nuts and bolts from China, you can do it. You can manufacture in Africa and supply the African market. And and is the case? Is it going to be cheaper? Significantly cheaper in doing that? It will be significantly cheaper because um, the first the first element that will make it cheaper is is the logistics part. The logistics part, you're bringing the, the steel from China via the ships, the ocean economy, and uh, or, or you bring it by, by planes. It depends on the bulks of steel that is coming in. But, you know, they are lining up in the airports and in the, in the customs, uh, in the harbors. So it's cheaper to, to take it by road, to take it by rail in within South Africa, within Africa, rather than waiting six weeks for one okay. uh, ton of oh, steel to come. Got it, got it, I got it. So, so I have a couple of suggestions for you. First and foremost, and this please, I will qualify what I'm telling you by the fact that 1 million by 1 million only caters to technology and technology enabled services businesses. We don't do any other kind of business. Your business is primarily a manufacturing business, but, in this day and age, given what's going on in every part of industry, including the manufacturing industry, I think you're going to have much greater success in your fundraising quest if you frame this business as an e-commerce business, whereby it's a B2B e-commerce business where you do your manufacturing in Africa and, and build your products and then you're you kind of sell through, not through retail, but through e-commerce to your customers. And I, uh, I don't know enough about what's happening in Africa. This is something I would like request you to research. In the mm -hmm. Western world, we have B2B manufacturing supply chains catered to by marketplaces. So there wow. are two sided okay. market because where manufacturing companies and, and or their entire supply chain operate within these marketplaces. And these B2B marketplaces are very successful marketplaces. So if you were doing this in America, I would say if, you're, if you are the supplier, go plug into one of these marketplaces. Now, I have no reason to believe that Africa has such a marketplace. But it is something that you should research. If there is any marketplace, any kind of B2B marketplace happening, B2B uh, manufacturing marketplace happening in Africa where you can sell your products. But I think 
if you pitch this as a modern 21st century e-commerce venture where your you know, product is this product which you can do much cheaper than the Chinese manufacturers, but the business that you are trying to finance is an e-commerce business, I think you would have a much greater level of success in trying to raise money. And, and you can start, you're going to have to start doing the business, you know? Yes, then, yes. Um, I don't think you can fund the concept. Nobody funds concepts. So, so in fact, if you are telling me that there is, a, there is a manufacturing company that you have a relationship with that is already manufacturing in Africa, and if you can source the product from them and start selling and start acquiring customers in this e-commerce venture mode, that would give investors a lot more confidence to start working with you. That will start giving mm -hmm. you proof points and start, you know, helping you, uh, you know, build relationships with the customers and so forth. So by the time you come to the investors, if you have a bunch of customer relationships that people are buying from you, that would give them confidence. So these are the ways we de develop validation to make investors comfortable. Investors don't like unvalidated businesses. That is a fact. Whatever business you're doing, investors do not like unvalidated businesses. Paul, I would uh, love to hear if you have any comments for Mteto here. Well, I can only uh, confirm everything that Sri Samana said. On the one hand, uh, it would be very difficult to find technology investors to convince them to invest in more traditional business. So the only way to fundraise among such investors would be, as you recommended, you know, going to more technology side, maybe regarding yes, the, the e-commerce. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, um, and then you, you, you have a shot, yes? Uh, uh, because right now, from what you describe, you have more traditional business. So maybe you'll be able to find some maybe uh, angel investors from steel manufacturing, uh, both distribution that will invest in you. But no venture capital or private equity fund at this moment would be actually would, would consider such an investment, at least from my European experience. Uh, yes. I don't know to which extent. Well, I think it's true in Africa the, the as well. We, we see Africa enough in our uh, you know, round tables. I, I think Africa is exactly in that same condition. So that those I would I think that is our feedback to you, Amteto. Okay, okay. So so yeah, I think you kind of covered my my my, my question was, I if, if you are aware of any investors that have an appetite first in manufacturing, secondly uh, in Africa, and if 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 if, if perhaps uh, one can try to include uh, your, your, your uh, whatever indicators you'll give in in, in my research. So, um, if you could wait, I will explain how to use 1 million by 1 million for fundraising after this. Okay. Um, after the next pitch, there's one more pitch and then I'll explain to you how to use 1M by 1M. Okay. Riksa Banerjee, are you hey. online? Yes, yes I go am. ahead. Hi, Riksa. Hi, nice to meet you. Hi, everyone. Yeah. My name is Rita, and this is still an ideation stage. It hasn't launched, and I wanted to check in the gaps and fissures in the launch before I actually implement and start investing uh, for okay. the pilot. I do have a website, but it's mostly for consulting, and um, they have different uh, services just because I'm an architect engineer. so. I'm trying to start getting revenue for my other ideas as well, like as a passive income. This is one of the ideas that I've been trying to develop. However, uh, I think there are gaps. So I wanted to put it together as a concept and see where it goes. So the idea is uh, having a rent renting closet, which Rent the Runway actually does already. However, this concept is a little different than Rent the Runway. It's not a fashion uh, level. It is more like a regular day-to-day -day and you need something quickly. And we want to convert our cup closets to a capsule closet. And that is a limited option. Sometimes we do want to 
change it uh, or have different options. And many of the times, and uh, we do have those, and it goes to recycling, donation, because seasons change, fashions change, we change. And the idea uh, with this concept would be to have more options without having to recycle, which goes into the waste, etc. Next slide, please. Uh, so the idea starts with you have to compartmentalize your customer categorization. What are the brand categories? Whether it's the high uh, premium la labels or what are the target? Customers, so there are categorization and then how we reach those each categorization. Next is the time wave because, you know, we can pick up a similar product in a store or consignment store. It's very easy to get a $20 to $50 range product. If you're in a rush, you have a meeting, you need a blazer, not going to wait, you know, look into the app and go spend time on it. It is a very cheaper option, how you're going to reach your customer and engage them and knit it together to so, make it um, successful. Rigda, I have a question for you. Are you saying that you're going to follow the same model as Rent the Runway? Rent the Runway requires that you, um, somebody is selling the product to them. Uh, no, this is not same as rent the runway because rent the runway, they do have a warehouse. This That's is right. without a warehouse where it is in between a, a clothing swap and a warehouse system. So this is a peer to peer, not a warehouse enabled system. This is a peer to peer system. Right. So the customers here can be owners as well. Like they earn commission based on the items being rented or sold. On the platform. And are you so so you're doing renting, selling, both? Both. Okay. And and is this going is it shipping? Are people shipping products? Yeah, the, that's the next part. Uh, part we go into the details in the next couple of slides. Uh, next. So what's the need? Uh, New York City or many large West uh, developed urban areas, we have this issue of decluttering. We spend our earnings because we need different attires for different occasions. And most of the time we don't use it for rest of the year. It just stays. And uh, if you look at the average income of a person, you do need to socialize, but more we are looking, this is adding stress in our lives. And uh, next slide. So average rent versus how we spend and New York City, just a pilot case if you pick like average apartment sizes are smaller. Next slide. Uh, so the pain point is most of the time seasonal clothing goes into storage or you put it aside and you never use it. While in other parts of the country or places you can use it and ship it when you are traveling somewhere and you don't want to you know, carry everything together. You can go like an Airbnb concept. And before you're traveling, you can look up the attires or outfits available there and even try and like do a virtual uh, check-in on FaceTime or the app will enable it so you can trial it using it, even check it out at the best. And that will be the question. Uh, selling point between uh, rent the runway versus uh, other platforms where you uh, don't have that time gap to pick it up. You don't spend the time to pick it up. It could be two preference. One is you can either pick it up if you're traveling somewhere or you are locally there in person, it's your choice. And the other option would be to uh, be shipped via the renter or the owner of the clothing. They can ship it, label it and make sure it ships within the time they want to uh, get it put together. So how do we compete with this option? Because a customer can have different options. There are stores like Target, H&M, TJ Maxx, where you can actually go and try it out in a fitting room in a brick and mortar store. And if you're in a hurry and you wanna 
you know, you don't care that much about a 35 to $50 range product for a one-time use if you're missing something versus how do you make it uh, successful? Uh, you also have run the runway, you can use those. So how do you tie in? It's the concept of social uh, minimalization as well as economic and recycling where we are trying to make money customers are trying to make money so the selling point is here we don't have a big player we are tying with the big players where you can shop if you are like that kind of a personality who likes to own different stuffs while you are also using others to uh, help your fashion styling so you can tag this with your pinterest or if you are an influencer you can use your what uh, offer your wardrobe to others who don't have that much of capacity and bandwidth. And price range you remains think, the same. Um, have you, what validation have you done? Um, I, I'll tell you what my, I'm listening to you and my reservation is, you know, rent the runway is, I am not renting my closet out. I'm selling my merchandise to rent the runway. Rent the runway is, renting it out and, and bringing it back, cleaning it, renting it again, all of that stuff. If you're coming directly into my closet, one, it's, it's a lot of overhead for me to get it cleaned and stuff. Um, one, you know, somebody will have to guarantee that it's clean. And, uh, you know, what is the guarantee that it's clean? Dry cleaning is expensive. So there's, there's all that overhead that kicks in gear. And secondly, um, I'm not sure if people, this is, I'm not saying it is not, a, you know, not something that will work, but you need to, I wouldn't do it. That's why I'm, I mean, you know, if you, if you ask me for feedback as a customer, would I do this? I would not do it. One, it's too complicated, too much logistics. And, you know, I, I don't, I mean, clothing is personal. I don't want to, you know, I don't want people to use my clothing. No, thank you. Goodbye. But there may be a customer who may be willing to do it, and you need to find the psychographic and the positioning of the segment of that customer. I don't know what that segment is. Right. So the initial concept is this, why this is different than rent a runway. Rent the runway is a entity itself. They get the profit and they own okay. the products. Here, okay. uh, the customers have uh, ownership. They are earning. So the that's the value differentiation in the overall impact creation right but it, it that, also comes with an enormous amount of logistics overhead which right you need to find so, customers a customer segment that has a the time to put up with that and and two is willing to you know right so that's another aspect i think that is covered in my next slide uh, i can go over that so, so have you done uh, have you done Customer validation? Uh, like a pilot, like a test plot. Or even talk to people. Have you talked to, have, have you figured out what segment, what are the characteristics of, um, you know, a, a customer base that is going to. Yeah, so oh. here's the thing, like people are not interested in buying used clothes. That's the idea, like even selling at a consignment store is hard. So the idea is you would uh, add that uh, overhead cost as part of your business model. And it is gets at some point it gets tied to these brick and mortar sellers. Even customers may uh, tie your uh, overheads to a partner shop like Target, which is out of business yeah, in this town. Problem I have with launching this right now is that you don't really know where you're going. You have done no validation work. And this company, before you invest, like you said, should you invest money in this? I'm not sure because you haven't done the validation exercise. So I'm going to recommend that you first do a formal validation exercise before you launch something like this. And, and if you need to learn that, we can teach you that, how to do that through 1 million by 1 million, but I would like you to learn that, do that before you launch this pro this project and start sure. investing big yeah. money in this project. Yeah, I haven't launched it, so that's why it's all kind it. of a Don't guesswork. This is not ready for launch at all. Yeah. 
Okay. So let me explain to you how to use 1 million by 1 million to both of you as well as those who are listening. Uh, in the meantime, uh, before I go there, if you like what we are doing, we are giving very uh, specific feedback and very candid feedback. It may not be feedback that you want to hear, but it's feedback that you need to hear. So if you like that approach, then do refer 1M by 1M to other friends and colleagues. Um, all the resources are at 1M by 1M.com. Uh, you'll find a blog that is active and terrific. So you will learn a lot just by following the blog and it's free. You can learn from the Answer Journeys book series. These are all case study based books. Each book has 12 to 16 case studies and they cover different topics. So it's a very good way to learn as well. These roundtables happen every week. So you're very welcome to come as many times as you want. You can pitch once for free, but you can attend as many times as you want. Um, the, the full acceleration program is 1M by 1M premium. That's where all the mentoring, all the methodology training, everything happens. We have a curriculum that we will have you follow um, that will teach you step by step how to do all this stuff that we're talking about, whether it's validation or positioning or, you know, how to build a, an e-commerce venture, all of that stuff is kind of treated in the curriculum in lots of details with lots of case studies. So um, all that is available as part of the premium program. There are weekly roundtables. You can come and talk to me every week. So if you're looking for ongoing, you know, coaching, mentoring, that is your option through 1M by 1M. And then, of course, when you get ready for financing, financing is just by joining 1M by 1M premium, you don't get introduced to investors. You have to do the work and get yourself ready before we make introductions to investors. And, if, and some people never get there because sometimes their business is not fundable. Sometimes the business doesn't get to a point of financeability. There is this notion of fundability. If you're assuming that you're going to do your business with outside capital, you have to factor in the notion of fundability. We can help you test fundability, audit fundability, all of that, and give you a strategy of how to build your business. But please don't assume that you can raise funding off the bat. Go to the self-assessment on the 1M by 1M website. That self-assessment gives you venture capital due diligence questions. You have to put your business through these questions and see if you can compelling, in a very compelling way, answer these questions. If you can, then there's a chance that you can get funding. But you have to also convince me before I will open my Rolodex and introduce you to investors. That's, we have a tremendous Rolodex. We have worked with hundreds of investors. You know, actually probably more than 1,000 investors at this point, but you have to find the right set of investors that will resonate with your idea. That's the notion of investor entrepreneur fit, and you have to be at a stage where you, can, you are fundable. These are requirements for getting funded. Please be very careful about making assumptions. Maureen is giving you a pre-seed investor course on Udemy, which you could do to understand better how pre-seed investment works. If you're trying to raise money very early on, you may want to go do that Udemy course to just learn how pre-seed investors think. The bootstrapping course is a one-hour course, free course on our website. You can go take a look at it. It gives you a lot of understanding um, that you, know, you would need to factor into your business strategy. Um, the Udemy courses, we have, you know, 30 Udemy courses on that, that are very reasonably priced. You can acquire them for actually Maureen is giving you a bunch of coupons there, but, uh, you know, all of these are often on sale and we provide coupons um, pretty much every month. We provide coupons to acquire them at reasonable prices. So there's, you know, a whole list of courses that you can do there. You can also do the entire 1M by 1M curriculum on a subscription basis. That's 1M by 1M basic curriculum only. Uh, you're welcome to sign up for that. And um, 
So go to the website, dig around, look at what to expect from basic, what to expect from premium, Udemy courses, investor introduction policy, all of that, and, and figure out what works for you, what learning model works for you, but you have to, you know, there's a lot of learning. In a first time entrepreneur's journey, there's a lot of learning. And what we are trying to do is give you a compressed, efficient path to traverse that path, that journey of learning. You have no way of avoiding that learning. You have to learn. Otherwise, you're not going to be successful. So all we can do is provide you the resources with which to learn. The rest is up to you. We can't do the learning for you. You're going to have to do the learning yourself. We can give you the resources. We can give you the pointers. We can give you the methodology, but you're going to have to do the work to learn. It's like a gym membership, right? You don't lose weight by joining a gym. You lose weight when you lift weights and run on the treadmill or do the rowing machine and all of that. So here are all your rowing machines and treadmills and everything for your entrepreneurship training. Get going. All right, curriculum is entirely case study based. We have thousands of case studies. You do get to learn from other entrepreneurs. I'm not teaching you this curriculum on my own. I'm teaching you with thousands of entrepreneurs who have done it before, and you get to learn from them. You essentially get to talk to thousands of entrepreneurs who have done it before and thousands of investors who are investing this in, this, um, in the tech startup world. So mm. tremendous amount of depth and tremendous amount of insight available from the curriculum that you do need to do the work to absorb all that. Uh, investor introduction policy is clearly stated in the, on the website on this link that I have on the screen right now. Our philosophy is don't go to investors as beggars, go as kings. This is the philosophy of the program, and what that means is you have to bootstrap first, raise money later, get to validation before you can attract capital. That is all. We have uh, one more roundtable in July, and then three more in August, which is the summer lineup, the rest of the summer lineup, so four more this summer. And uh, we can take questions at this point. If you have questions, please uh, rig up. And Teto, you can ask questions. If anybody else yes. in the room wants to ask questions, please feel free. Yeah, I have a few questions. Like I know uh, you said about testing and validation. Even when yeah. you do like a prep work, uh, just because I have never launched, say for example, like making an app, how to kind of customize it, what it would be like concept. How do you really test it and uh, kind of make sure do you the are curriculum. In... There's a module on validation, do the curriculum. Join one by one in basic and start rolling on the positioning and the curriculum module and get going. Yeah, like not investing from the get go, like how to kind of make that money while you are in progress. Oh. So all the bootstrapping techniques that we use are covered also in the curriculum. Okay. So there's a whole module on bootstrapping, there's a whole module on positioning, there's a whole module on uh, validation. I would say if you join the curriculum, those would be the three modules that you should put yourself through ASAP and it will answer the kinds of questions you, are, you have in your mind. Okay. Okay. Okay, so so I just uh, no. Thank you very much for the feedback, and uh, I think for me it's, it's it's quite candid that I receive it from from, from you guys, and um, I'll definitely take it kindly, and I'll try and log into these um, links and see you know what value can I extract from them. The question I have uh, right now is, um, I also I told you that I've got a three-legged business. I've also got an Im immigration business. And that is uh, more on a consulting basis, but I also, you know, have an idea to formalize it because I kind of have agreements with many players um, across the world. I've got players, uh, partners in the UK, uh, CS Global, I've got partners. Yes. Um, I personally do not believe in lots of parallel businesses. If you try yes. to do lots of parallel businesses, you don't succeed in any of them normally. 
there are counterpoints to this. Elon Musk is a counterpoint, but I don't think you are Elon Musk. So <laughs> if you I should have had this experience. Some, somebody was pitching me this in one of these roundtables. Somebody was pitching me that, oh, I have three different businesses. And, 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 and I said, no, I don't think you should do three different businesses. Pick one and build one. And he said, no, well, Elon Musk is doing three of them. Why shouldn't I? I'm like, well, you're not Elon Musk. That's why. But if you think that you are Elon Musk, then you have nothing to learn from me. I have nothing to teach Elon Musk. And I have nothing to teach somebody who thinks he's Elon Musk. So, I, mean, I don't know how to answer that question. But, uh, but in, in one, 1M by 1M, if you join 1M by 1M, we can work on your on one of your businesses. I can't work on three businesses in in one go. So pick which one you want to work with us on. I'm willing to, if you decide that you join the program, I'm willing to look at your three options and give you my perspective on which one to focus on. That I'm willing to do. But after that, yes. you're going to have to pick one and, and work with us on one. So if you have questions about the program, by the way, after this session, you can call Irina Patterson on the phone, on WhatsApp, by just send her an email and she will, you know, set up a time to talk to you and, and you can ask her more questions. She knows the program really well and can guide you on if you have any further questions. Okay, okay. Anybody okay. else? Anybody in the room? Um, do you have any questions? Any of the attendees? Hi, Sramana. I'm not sure if I'm connected via audio. Uh, yeah, I? I can hear you. Can you introduce Hi. yourself, please? Yeah, hi, I'm Sohan. Um, I am an entrepreneur, uh, primarily, uh, you know, ideating on in the sports domain. Uh, uh -huh. I have been working for long, long years to uh, launch a parallel, uh, you know, cricket ecosystem, ecosystem um, you know, wherein you're targeting tens of millions of non-mainstream cricketers uh -huh. to offer them a legitimate and a pro uh, global uh, format. Okay. So to, uh, I'm not sure if uh, this forum would have an interest or it's a legit, um, you know. Uh, Only if you know, it has a technology angle to it. If you do not have a technology angle, if it's a pure, you know, offline uh, project, mm -hmm. then this is not the right forum for you. Um, I think every sport today has a technology angle. You looking at the, uh, you know, humongous number who participate at the grassroots mm -hmm. level and right up to the pro level. Um, mm -hmm. You know, for example, cricket, um, you know, I'm looking at almost 1 million participants, uh, you know, across the world, um, you know, at the grassroots level, and then they move on to become a pro player. And similarly, the badminton that I'm working on, it also has similar numbers. So the apps, you know, where you connect with all your grassroots players, uh, if you know the IPL or if you know the T20 World Cup and all, they have very strong technology angle. That's the okay, way to so reach you out. Need, if, you, if you can pitch your product, uh, pitch your business as a technology business, then this is the right forum for you. Uh, Probably and, not as a technology business, but the technology has an angle to this business. It will drive the It sports. will have to be a technology-enabled business. See, e-commerce is not a technology business per se, but it's a technology-enabled hmm. business. Hmm. Um, so, unless technology enables business, unless there's a sizable technology component to it, this is not the right place for you. If you if it's a, if you can pitch this as a technology enabled business, then it's the right forum for you. Otherwise, not. Okay, I think I'm not sure if it's uh, technology driven. Um, you know, it's a sports at the end of it, so maybe not. Yeah. All right, that's that's for you to judge. Sure. Okay, folks, I think that is all. Paul, thank you for staying through and uh, thank you for participating today. It was nice to meet you and, and getting to know what's happening uh, in your part of the world. It's, it's quite encouraging that you have five to 10,000 B2B SaaS businesses in Eastern and Central Europe actually today. That's, that's a lot of progress in that region. Thank you very much for the conversation for the invite. Bye-bye. Take care, everybody. I will see you next week. Okay.